you know, there are millions, millions of questions. The only real answer is love. Welcome back to Mind Matters, everyone. I'm Harrison Cayley, joined as usual by Elon Martin. Hello. And Adam Daniels. Hello. And today we are very pleased to have with us Mary Balog, a several dozens times New York Times bestseller and author of over 90 novels and several dozen novellas. It's a pleasure to have you here. Is there anything else we should add to that, Mary, that you, that you need to... No. To get out there. That's quite enough. That's quite enough. <laughs> well, um, you are a, like me, we're, we are fe fellow Canadians. So I was happy to find you um, through, through others who recommended your work um, because, uh, well, you, as anyone who has listened to our previous show on romance novels finds out that we all did this experiment where we, we, we started reading this genre that we'd never read before. And it was kind of odd, you know, probably, probably a lot of the, a lot of our regular listeners who, who listened to that were probably surprised. I don't know. We had a very good response to it. Um, maybe I just wanted to start out by asking you maybe, well, there's two questions. One, I want to know what you think, how would you describe your, the, the genre? How would you describe romance? And why do you think that men seem to actively avoid it? Romance is love stories. I mean, romance as a, as a literary genre is love stories. Um, the main um, ingredient of it, the, the main thing that has to be there is the happy ending. Um, there are lots of books, many of them written by men, Nicholas Box comes to mind, who write what some people claim to be romance, although he furiously um, denies that. Uh, and we're quite happy to let him deny it. <laughs> um, you know, to write a true romance, it has to have a happy ending, and it's a love story. It's it's the uh, the story of a man and a woman. There there are some um, same sex romances, but I'll confine my remarks to uh, heterosexual ones at the moment. Um, a man and a woman from the beginning of the book, where there's indifference, hostility, certainly no real togetherness or love. Uh, move through the story to a point at which they are committed to a love relationship, usually marriage. Mm -hmm. um, apart from that, it, it's such a huge, diverse genre that it's pretty hard to, to say it must have this, it must have mm -hmm. that. It mustn't have anything as long as it works and people read it, except the happy ending. Mm -hmm. Romance readers will throw the book at the wall and through the wall if they invest a few hours reading it and the hero or the heroine die at the end, or even the dog, uh, not allowed. It has to have a happy ending. Uh, what was the other question? Well, Why about men. The men? Yeah. Yes, I think part of the reason is that it's written mostly by women. Um, it concentrates very largely upon emotion and feelings and traditionally, um, men don't like to talk about feelings or show them or dwell upon feelings. At least this is the stereotypical image of men. I think there's some truth in it. Mm -hmm. And they don't think they would enjoy that sort of uh, literature. Yeah. And then it's written by women and, and maybe most men would prefer to pick up books written by men. I'm not mm -hmm. sure it works the other way around. Um, why else? I'm not quite sure. M maybe just you said yourself, um, Harrison, in, in your talk and when you uh, messaged me mm -hmm. that you once had a bookstore mm -hmm. and you, you never really paid any mm -hmm. attention to the romance section. You, you mm -hmm. treated it with 
I won't say contempt, although it might have been, but certainly as something that didn't apply to you at all. Yep. And I, I think this is this is common. You know, we have these. It's not just men with romance. We have prejudices against certain things, certain genres of genre of literature. We assume we won't enjoy them without mm -hmm. ever really having tried them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say that in, in our bookstore, the romance section was probably twice the size, at least twice the size as the horror section, not quite as large as the science fiction fantasy section, but we just had these hundreds of books. And and yeah, I, I don't think that I was uh, contemptuous at the time, but just, just it was it was just there, right? And I, yeah. and and uh, I just kind of didn't pay much attention to it. And I, I'll I'll share my thoughts. That uh, I thought your act, your description of of men, you know, typically is, is probably quite accurate. I think that's I think it's you know it's a stereotype, but it's true for the most part. And I think that there's an interesting dynamic because you see that in the male characters in a lot of these novels, right? They they start out a particular way. As you said, the, there has to be a happy ending, but along the way, um, and, st and from the beginning, there is conflict or indifference or um, even even more than conflict. Like there are, there are all kinds of problems that have to be worked through and resolved to get to that ending. And a lot of the men at the, the, at the start of the stories they they probably wouldn't read romance novels if they were given the choice, right? right. <laughs> so maybe that uh, well that can lead me to a question about characters and and writing in particular, because one of the things I find in your novels, and I've got a couple just to just to hold up. Um, I mentioned these ones in our in our show a few weeks ago. I've got uh, oh where are they? I've got Heartless and Silent Melody here. Can I get them both on the screen? Well, there's two of them. Um, mm -hmm. Great books. And the thing about your characters is that they are, first of all, it's not like, I mean, like I said, you've written over 90 books and you don't write the same characters. Each character is their own person. And I think that is a kind of a testament to the, to your skill as a writer, but I want to I want to learn a bit more about that because each of these characters, like all the men, even if I kind of um, you know made my own generalization there that that maybe these these guys probably all these guys probably wouldn't read romance novels, they're still their own unique person. It's like it's like you've you've managed to take and all great authors do this. I think they've managed to take a real person and somehow get them into this story. So I want to know, how has the process changed for you over the years? Like when you started writing, how did you create a character? And how maybe how has that changed over the years of writing? Because you've been writing for over 30 years now. I'm not sure there's been that much change, mm -hmm. except maybe that through experience, I've learned to get deeper and deeper into the characters I create. I think maybe at the start, I did most of my thinking ahead of time, mm -hmm. created a character and then wrote a story for him. Now it tends to be the other way around. I'm creating a story and I have this person in there. And with every page I write, I realize I don't know this person. I, I, I know an awful lot about him or her by now, but I don't know them. And almost right up to the end of the story, I'm still doing this discovery. They're not characters to me. They're people that I'm trying to understand. Um, the difference, I suppose, between characters and real people for me is that with characters, they are my own, so I can get right inside them. I can become them. And I, I think maybe that's the, um, the secret for me. I, I actually become them and I feel their feelings and I think their thoughts and I remember their memories. Um, and, and, you know, there's always, even with ourselves, there is, there's some times where we don't fully know ourselves or understand ourselves. Why did I do that? Why did I say that? Where did that come from? 
Um, when it's a character, you know, you have to I, dig deep and try to find out fully why they are as they are. And the reason they're all different is that people are different. You know, sometimes I, I have a character, especially now after writing so many books, and I start to think, oh, oh I've done this character before. Mm -hmm. But as the story progresses, I realize, no, I haven't. I've done someone like him. But they have different backgrounds. They have different families. They have different characters, experiences, education. They're, they're similar, perhaps, to someone else, but they're not the same. And, and my job is to, to bring that out. I, as a reader, I, some, I have some favorite authors, but I don't like it when I start to feel this author is writing the same old, same old, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I like this author, but I've, I've read this hero now about a dozen times. Mm -hmm. and there's almost no difference except eye color maybe and hair color. Um, I, I don't want my writing to be like that. And I don't think it will because they are real people and there are no two people, even twins, mm -hmm. who are identical in every way so uh mm -hmm. if, I, I, if it's a, fine <laughs> <laughs> i want to get into that a bit more because you said that maybe at the beginning you you planned your characters a bit more beforehand and that's not, now it's kind of the off, opposite so but i wanted to know maybe this has changed too do you consciously take from your personal experience like maybe a like uh, maybe a feature of someone you know will will you'll say, oh, I want to put that somewhere, or or someone from your past, or or reading other other material, maybe um, you know, just uh, like a public figure or a historical figure, or or does that kind of just all seep into you, and then and then you just find a character in your mind? Um, sometimes I'll have a character going. And this character will be reacting a certain way or talking or behaving a certain way. And I'll suddenly think, oh, this is so-and-so. You know, a, a favorite aunt of mine, for example. I can remember that happening, that this character was starting to behave. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's my aunt. <laughs> and from that point on, I could use that in the character development. I think, well, how would she react to this? What would she say? What would her facial expression be? Um, it, it's never a deliberate thing. I never decide, you know, I'm going to use my aunt now in this book. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I found it happening. And then once I realize that, I can either stop it if it's something I don't want to do, or I can make the most of it. And it sort of helps me along. I know how that character would react because I know mm -hmm. that person that this character reminds me yep. of. It doesn't happen often, but it okay. does happen. That's interesting. So, well, because when I was thinking about this question, because I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a writer. Um, I think the last, the last bit of, you know, what I would call fiction that I wrote was in high school. And, um, but I'm fascinated by writers. And I've always, I've, I'm fascinated by maybe the different approaches that different writers might take in, you know, in their writing. And one thing that came to mind was, there seems to be this spectrum from the the totally analytical like plan everything by the numbers and say I'm going to I'm going to hit this mark here and this mark here and then it's just it's like a um a little toy castle that you put together like or paint or almost paint by numbers but not in a not necessarily in a um I don't mean that as a any kind of insult for cuz some writers are very good at that right the plotters they are the plotters the plotters yes yes <laughs> The, the gun the gunpowder plotters <laughs> and then but then on the other end of that spectrum is the what i might call the kind of full maybe stream of consciousness and i have a thing in a thing in mind about that because um i'm i'm into some weird some weird things to read about like i like reading about parapsychology and and like old like um um investigators from the like society for psychical research back in the 1800s and there was a there was a woman, I think she was in the early 1900s. I, I can't remember for sure. I should have looked her up. But um, it's a famous case. It might have... Well, I can't remember. But she did a form of automatic writing where she'd basically go into a trance and she wrote novels while in a trance. And she she would get out of the, out of the trance, have no idea what she'd written, and then 
um, maybe a week or two later, go back in a trance and pick up like mid sentence where she'd left off beforehand. And they were, these novels were actually published and she was kind of, this was that was part of a, an experiment. Like there, there were some, some, uh, scientists who worked, you know, who worked with her and, and kind of documented this, but there, so there, there seems to be the spectrum between like the analytical portion and just the, the kind of, kind of complete inspiration. Um, and I, so it sounds like you're more on the inspiration side of that spectrum. I just wanted to know if you have had any comment on that or um, if that kind of, how do you, how do you, how do you think analytically about your, about your process and how you spend your time writing? Well, writers can be divided roughly into two camps, the plotters, the first type you described, mm -hmm. and the pantsers. The second type, the one who write from the seat of their pants. <laughs> well, that's the thing, that's what we're known as, and I'm a pantser. Um, I can't plan a story ahead of time. Fortunately, I've only ever had one editor who insisted on um, a full synopsis before I started writing a book. I, I can't do it. No, nothing will come. I can get a vague idea of how I want a story to start and a vague idea maybe of the main characters. But until I, until I get in there and the characters start acting and reacting and talking and thinking, I have no idea what's going to happen. And, um, you know, sometimes maybe I do have some idea. I want that to happen later on in the book, definitely. Mm -hmm. But by the time I get there or even long before I get to that point, my character is no longer the sort of person I thought he was going to be. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't do that thing that I really, really wanted him to do. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I'm, I'm a pantser. The story comes out of character and how they react to situations and the situations just come from goodness knows where. Mm -hmm. And I always laugh when some people tell me that I, I have such good plots. <laughs> <laughs> I don't oh. have any plots. <laughs> I feel like a big fraud. But, uh, yeah, I, my stories just develop as they come. Mm. Wow. So something I wanted to ask you, Mary, but one of the things that um, I think um, I find so appealing about your books is that there is uh, such a kind of brutally honest depiction of the inner contradictions that people have, the the struggles and the, the thought processes that they're one set against the other that rings so true to me, and also their um, their reference to memory and how the memory of and the pain of certain events has its influence in the present and, and the choices that they're making in the present. Uh, these are the things that I've found so compelling about your writing because I, I feel like it's so insightful and it was really the last thing I had expected to read um, in in these books, so if if someone, <laughs> I'm sorry, stereotyping. Yes, you, you were stereotyping. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, but to my utter delight, I've been proved wrong. I wonder, after so many years of getting feedback from readers, like I I have a clear idea of what value exists in your writing to me what what are the things aside from it being an entertainment have you um heard from readers that things that your books had had given them uh was there is there a single kind of uh bit of um of uh feeling or or knowledge or um understanding that you that you seem to get from all the people who've written to you? I get a whole spectrum of reactions, um, favorable reactions, a few negative ones too, but I'll stick with the favorable. Mm -hmm. I'm always very, very happy if people just really imply that they get entertainment from my books. I mean, that it's, it's not a bad thing to spend your life giving people entertainment, sort of making them happy and comfortable and relaxed. Uh, you know, even if there was no more than that, I would feel I hadn't wasted my life. Mm -hmm. But 
I get a, a lot of people comment on, on the characters and the depth of characters and that they really appreciate that, that when they read one of my books, they sort of get lost in, in it and in the characters. Sometimes I get very, very touched by messages when people find that a particular book strikes a particular nerve. Um, when I was writing my Survivor series, I don't know if any of you have read any of those books. It's about seven people, six men and one woman, who spent three years in a sort of convalescent home during and after the Napoleonic Wars, all there together, recovering from various wounds. And then the, the series tells the stories of all seven of them. But uh, I had a flood of reaction to that. And really, it hadn't struck me until I started to get this reaction that what I was describing was the PTSD that people are so familiar with these days. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who'd you know, had experience with wars these days really um, identified with those books in some ways it's a bit terrifying because i don't do that much hard research when i write my books i do it all imaginatively mm -hmm. imagining what it would feel like to suddenly lose your sight mm -hmm. um, during war and then have to go through the rest rest of your life blind what does that feel like right. you know how do you cope how do you recover and make a meaningful life of um for yourself when that has happened, when you're a young man. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, hearing from people and how they'd been touched by various stories like this, it was just, you know, it just wows me. And I think, goodness, I'm, I'm really doing something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. it, it's a lovely thing to feel when you're a romance writer and you're, you know, lots of people think you're just writing fluff. Mm -hmm. Right. So to know that people actually appreciate and understand, know what, know what I'm trying to do. Sometimes people will say something and I think, wow, they really got it. Mm -hmm. What I was trying to say, I, I don't try, to, I don't preach in my books. I don't press a message on people, but some people get it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if they don't, if they're entertained, that's fine. But it's lovely to know sometimes that people get it. Or if they quote a sentence from my books that, you know, that means something to them. And I think, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, it's just a sentence. But it, was, it meant something to me when I wrote it. But to know that someone particularly noticed that sentence. Something happened a, just a few weeks ago, I think. Someone put a sent me a sort of little poster on my Facebook page with a quote on it. And I was reading the quote and thinking, oh, what a gorgeous quote. And then I looked at Anthony <laughs> Mary Bellock. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I have a sentence I wanted to read, and this one's from Heartless. <laughs> and it, it made quite an impression on me because I've never uh, read anything quite like this, but I thought, this, for me, just nails it. And you write, Love, Luke found, though he was not fully conscious of the thought, returned in a powerful rush and grabbed his heart in a vice and did not let go. Love was the most intensely exalting emotion life had to offer, and the most frightening. Fear and exaltation mingled and were indivisible, the one a part of the other. Love was what made life worth living not the pursuit of pleasure, but love. Love, which involved the full spectrum of human emotions. And, and to say, I, I mean, I was like, it was a little bit of a, a gasp because, you know, you're reading this story and it, you, you, you make it even bigger with this realization of, of Luke's that becomes our realization uh, with, with all its wisdom and insight. And so it's those gems, I feel, that uh, contribute so greatly to your stories um, because they, they fit and yet uh, they are their own thing. That's nice. Thank you. And going along um, with, uh, well, I had, I had uh, quoted um, 
one of your books uh, in the previous show that we did. Um, uh, the first book in the uh, Westcott series, uh, Someone to Someone okay. to Love? Yes. Yeah. Um, where she, the main character, was talking about um, the the virtues of telling stories and and what what it is that stories can do and what it can accomplish and i thought that was such a beautiful description of what what it is that stories can accomplish and i i i mean i re i quoted it in the in the show because i i loved it so much and thinking about it more um one of our listeners had posted on your Facebook page um, something about the um, the way that romantic relationships seem to be the way that uh, nature gives us an opportunity to work through our past issues and our past traumas. It, by opening ourselves up to love from another person, we're able to heal ourselves. And, um, and so I think that that is a similar thing that your books are doing. As a, in a, as a as a sur surrogate, I guess you could say, um, or as a stand-in, where maybe somebody has a a previous relationship that was particularly traumatic for one reason or another, and by reading your books, they're able to come to some kind of a resolution um, of that relationship because they have a better understanding of themselves and and of the other person with whom they were in the relationship with, and and so. Yeah, I can totally understand that, um, you know, you have this, uh, you know, if people are just entertained, then that's great um, because they still got something out of it. But there is obviously so much more that you're putting into these books uh, than merely entertainment. And I think it's absolutely wonderful and fantastic. And I'm totally fanboying out right now. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Well, one of the, you, you mentioned in your process of writing that you have to, maybe, well, maybe it's not that you have to, but you do, you, you, f you get into that character, you become that character, you feel what they feel, you remember you, their memories, and it's, it's almost like you are the, the vanguard, you're the, the person that's going out into the trenches and, and finding these people, and then putting their experiences down on paper. And then your readers then get to re, um, they get to take part in that process with you, because then by reading by reading your account of of what you've experienced and kind of and shaped, you know, in your own mind, they then get to feel what these characters feel, and not to the same degree, but within the framework of your story, then remember, like if they're reading a memory, they get to remember with them. If they're feeling something, they get to feel that with them. And if they have a conflict, it's basically a, an empathetic process where you are experiencing the lives of other people that probably have some things in common with you and some things that aren't in common with you, D different backgrounds, different, uh, different personality traits. And there's this, this kind of resonance with these characters so that when the... I think that the, the happy ending is this, you're taking the reader through a process. You're taking them through all of these different emotions, through all of these different conflicts. And then in the process of res resolving those conflicts, by the end of the story, I think that that has an effect that something on some level is resolved in the reader if they go along with the process. Would you, uh, would you agree with that? Or do you have anything to say on, on that take? No, I think you're right. You know, the, the things people say about my books show that that, that does happen. Um, and I suppose it's the point of writing. Mm -hmm. um, when I write, I'm not just writing to entertain people, although obviously I have to do that for any, before anything else can happen. Mm -hmm. The book isn't entertaining. It can have all sorts of wisdom and other things in it. Nobody's going to bother to read it. Um, this is what I want to do. I, I want people to see these characters as real people who really have to go through real life 
experience this struggle within themselves, struggle with the, the other protagonists, struggle with uh, everything around them in order to come to a point where they, I, I won't say they can enjoy life, that's too too trivial, but I think to reach a point where you you have the, what I think of as the three types of love, where you can love yourself, not in a narcissistic way, but accept yourself for who you are and feel that you've confronted everything within yourself and you're comfortable with the person you now are. Mm. That's important. And, and you have to, I think, be in that place of, of accepting and loving yourself before you can offer love to other people. You've got nothing to offer if you're broken yourself. Um, so so you, you have to start with self-love and then love of the other person. And um, just love itself. And, you know, love has so many facets. Mm -hmm. And I try to bring out a lot of those in my writing too. It's not just um, a romantic relationship between two people in my books. I'm, I'm not just writing a love story. I'm writing about love. I, I very consciously do this. I am writing about love because love to me is the most Im important force in life. It's, mm -hmm. it's the only mm -hmm. um, answer to life. It's, you know, there are millions, millions of questions. The only real answer mm -hmm. is love. And, and that's what I want my books to, and it, to be about. And it comes through, and like you said, it's not just it's not just the the love between a a man and a woman in a relationship, but it's there there are friends and family members and and um, maybe enemies, but not quite that much. Like there might be just characters that are again in conflict in some ways, and it's it's just it's this it's this maze or this web of love. I, I'm just I'm on the um, I'm reading Promise of Spring right now. Um, the book that related to the web series, right? And yeah. but but one of the things that 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 I wanted to bring up is uh, I think it was in uh, the third the third in the web series with James and Madeline, and there yeah. are not just that one, but there are several stories where the conflict is so strong that wh when I'm reading, I'm like, oh, how are they going to get through this? <laughs> you know, I don't I don't see how this can be resolved. And it's it's I I feel that tension as I'm reading it, and and I'm almost um, uh, the the part of me that's engaged in the story is is um, is like um, just thinking, well, this can't work out. I, I just can't see I, I can't see what what can happen to to get to let them kind of get over themselves and and actually communicate and and say the things that they're not saying and and maybe put into perspective this part of their life that is influencing themselves so strongly. And then the analytical part of me is thinking, can Mary Balog pull this off? And will I be satisfied by the end? And so far I, I'm always satisfied <laughs> and I don't know how you do it, but I think, it, I think part of it is that, <clears throat> I think part of it is because you are, you hold love as that ideal. And I think you do it so authentically that that you are able to find the the interactions and the events that happen between these characters that will lead to that resolution in in a, a way that actually is, is genuine, and it's not it's not um, it's not plotted. You know, it's not like this has to happen for them to 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 do it. You discover it just as two two people in the real world would discover it on by themselves if they were successful. In doing it, um, I don't know if I had a a question about that, <laughs> but well, did, did maybe did you have any do you have any comment on any of those features of maybe like the the conflict and the well do you at do you at any point think I don't know how these characters are going to get through this? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes, but uh, it's always possible. There's always a way out. Um, and the more the more I write, the more relaxed I am about it, because no matter how bad things get, I think, OK, this has happened to me 67 times before and I've always found a way through. So I know it will. Mm -hmm. 
work out. There have been very few books, maybe one or two in my whole career that I've had to abandon mm -hmm. because I just can't make them work. It, it's happened once or twice, um, but not very often. Usually there is an answer. Uh, one thing though, that uh, I forget the exact thing you were talking about just now, but I thought, ah, oh, yes, but that takes a lot of hard work. Um, I think you said when you think there's no way through, but but it is and, and the reader follows through, but that, that's not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, so many times I'll, I'll write a story and I, I come to a point and I think, no, you know, I could make them do that. And sometimes I do. And I look back and I think, no, that that's not authentic. That's not real. That's too jagged. Um, so I have to go back and change and s smooth things out. I often compare this process to icing a cake. You know, when you're icing a cake, you, maybe as men, you wouldn't know that you ever ice cakes. Uh, anyway, I iced a cake. <laughs> you plop on the icing and then you smooth it out and you keep on. If you're a perfectionist, you keep on until it's a uniform thickness all over and it's perfectly smooth. There's not a blemish. But it doesn't it doesn't come with just a slip slap of the knife. It mm -hmm. takes a long time. And I, I think of the writing of a story like that, you know, it's. It's easy enough, well, not easy, but it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. possible to write a story that's satisfying, but I don't like jagged places yeah. and things that I've put in only because it's the easy answer, but it, it's, it doesn't ring quite true. They wouldn't really say that. No, they wouldn't really do yeah. that. And I have to smooth it out, smooth it out mm -hmm. until it just reads as if, it, as if I wrote it all in a day, mm -hmm. I hope. Mm -hmm. um, that's my aim anyway, that everything flows perfectly mm -hmm. and there's no problem. So easy to write. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I want people to yeah. think when they, when they read, you yeah. know, this and, is so easy. And you said two things there um, that, that, that do match with my experience of, of reading your books, because I, I've observed that, that, that it is a smooth process. And, and by smooth, that doesn't mean easy or easy to read because uh, I'm thinking of uh, James and Madeline again and I'm just cuz it's the last book that I that I finished of yours but there are several times when I would think um I, I just I wanted some relief you know I wanted them to stop fighting and stop stop this this conflict but with every sentence and with every like fight that they had an argument and and I was like well this has to happen because this is who who they are like I I, I might p part of me wants wants them to to just start to get get along but but I can see that that's just a that's just a wish that I had and it wouldn't be correct at that moment that no in this moment they are still going to fight and they're going to even like up the ante a bit and get even even a bit more mean with each other and and you know dig dig the knives in a little bit further and it reads totally it's totally authentic and genuine sounding like this okay this is the way it has to be and not just with this book, but with several other others, you talked about again that smoothness and um, and doing it for the for the reader's experience of it because it has to be genuine. And several times I've, when there is a shift, when there is a shift in understanding of the characters, I find that by the time it comes, it's one of those things where you say, well. Where did that happen? It seemed so natural, but you didn't you didn't see it coming, and you didn't and you didn't. Um, it, again, it's it's not jagged. That's the word that stood out for me. It's just it's almost seamless to the point where you can't even remember exactly where things started to change. It was just this this transition, this this transition. Maybe there was a seed of something there, and then it and then it comes to to bloom. And by the time it's there, it's almost like a magic trick where where suddenly it it works and it, the, the craft is 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 hidden within all these pages and uh well it's just it's kind of it's magical and kind of like remarkable and i th i think you succeed in doing that so i th i think you're an excellent cake uh cake maker in I, that sense <laughs> not really but i can do it in writing not with a real cake um that that book devil's web i think that was one of my harshest books mm -hmm. and it's quite an old book it's written in the 1990s i would think yeah 1990 is when I, it was published i wouldn't write that book now i uh, <laughs> it's too harsh mm -hmm. and there are one or two others that um you know I, because i do think basically a book should be an entertainment mm -hmm. and um 
I find, I think it happened, I was reading a, quite a favorite author of mine. She'd written a medieval romance and it was, I found it so harsh. I couldn't even finish it. I kept it, I can't take this. I know it's going to end happily, it's a romance, but I just couldn't take it. And then I thought, okay, if you can't take it from her, don't expect other people to take it from you. So uh, I, I think it might have been at about that point, you know, when I was still writing books like Devil's Web occasionally, uh, I wouldn't, it's just too harsh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a pretty harsh one. Say that. Yes, it is. Well, Mary, uh, we, we spoke a few minutes ago about um, writing your characters and that they're um, a part of you in a way. and. Mm -hmm even when some of them behave rather badly, the protagonists, um, there's still a sense that you love them, that you accept their limitations at that point in the story. And my, my feeling is that that acceptance, and you, you might even have a character, um, I'm thinking of Julia and her, uh, her cousin Fred, in the follow-up to um, Courting Julia, yeah. you know, she she says, or actually in Courting Julia, she says, I could kill you. Oh, no, this was, uh, I, I apologize. This was, um, this was in Dancing with Clara. Uh, yes. You know, she knows Fred very well, and, and there's this kind of humorous but real uh, anger and upset with her, with her cousin for behaving in the ways that he does even though he's he, you know he's struggling with himself and and certain terrible um habits he's indulged himself with but there's still a sense that uh that there is a an, an acceptance for um for these deeply flawed protagonists which i think is imparted on the reader uh you know it, you said before about being comfortable with who you are, loving yourself in, in a not narcissistic way, that um, that that comes through in in how you write these flawed characters, who are very human, and who I think are are kind of uh, not exactly um, models, but uh, they they're they're kind of the, the relationship that the reader has with these characters it can be i think appropriated for one's own acceptance of one's own um flaws and one's own shortcomings so uh, if you have anything to add to that thought um i'd be happy to hear it yes you made me think of um being a teacher i taught high school english for 20 years and of course, I had to teach Macbeth every year. It was on the grade 11 uh, list. I, I loved the play. But um, I always noticed in the teaching of that play the distinction among students, those who couldn't, under any circumstances, understand or empathize with either Macbeth or Lady Macbeth. And I can remember, you know, just about doing everything in my power to see them as people not 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 to condone what they did not to forgive them but to understand them and to empathize to know why they did it and to see why they are you know to see the fact that they, they're not totally evil people otherwise they wouldn't be suffering so much from what they've done um and some students nope no, 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 they are just black, evil, no empathy at all. And I can remember, you know, I was a very young person most of the, the time when I was teaching that, but it was, a, it was a lesson to me that some people are capable of empathy at varying levels. Some people are almost entirely incapable of empathizing with human weakness and to me that's um that's a terrible deficiency because if you can't empathize with other people mm -hmm. then you either have to be perfect yourself or you must hate yourself um so but but i could never uh, you know i could never uh, 
you know, get 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 through to some. Yeah. We had some lovely discussions, some very heated discussions with students, which I always appreciated. Mm -hmm. But it it was a real eye opener. I think until I started teaching, I didn't. I, I assumed everyone was like me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, they had the same attitudes to life and people and whatnot as as I did. And mm -hmm. it was a real eye opener to realize just not so, and to learn to live with with that and mm -hmm. with with other people. But it seemed to me such a shame, mm -hmm. the people who are totally cut off from empathy. I was just I was just curious when with that experience with the the the, the students in your classes. What would you say the the percentage was? Was it like uh, like one out of oh, ten, what? or five out of ten, or or is it hard to say? More than one, probably fewer than five. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think most people are quite you know they they won't forgive and they 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 hate those characters, but they still can you know yeah understand mm -hmm. why they did it and you know why they were suffering so much afterwards you know the few would say well good for them they deserve to suffer and they did but yeah. and some people couldn't see that but mm -hmm. yeah uh, it, you know, I, I would say it's it wasn't a huge percentage but still a significant one mm -hmm. yeah and, and i think that's a really good observation because uh you're saying yes they deserve to suffer but also we can feel empathy for the fact that they've made themselves suffer. And this yes. is a kind of a, a complex uh, understanding of, of empathy and, um, and the perceiving of others' development or issues. And, uh, and it's, you know, I think maybe we've been trained in some ways to think unidimensionally um, about other people and their actions and behaviors. And so when, when you, and that's something else I really enjoy about your books is that you, you, you give multiple perspectives. You know, the, one character is thinking about what the other character is thinking and experiencing, and we're getting even yet another character whose perspective is just as valuable uh, in some ways in, in, in the formation of the story. And yes, you know, Henrietta in Heartless is, uh she's sympathetic and she makes mistakes and you know it's it's an and it's not a it's not an end of the you know you, you can't put a complete um you can't define these characters uh in such black and white terms and i i believe that that's this multi-dimensional look at characters is also something that um allows us to uh broaden our own understanding of people and of ourselves yes i always hope so i i think maybe in some of my books particularly some of the earlier ones i may have what i think of as silly villains you know mm. ones who are purely evil mm. i think i've had a few of them i wouldn't do that now mm. um you know everyone is on it. well we all know that in life there are some people who are who appear to be total evil very very few but you know, the really scary few that you don't, one doesn't know why, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. But in the main, we're all on the spectrum. You know, if, if it's a color spectrum, we're all on the, you know, we're all in the gray area. We may be very dark gray or we may be almost white, but we're all in that, that gray spectrum. And I, I like to bring that out in my writing. Nobody, or at least pretty much nobody is purely evil, just as nobody is purely good. We're all somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Well, you, that's some, or did you want to say something? Else? No, I was just going to say that's something that we, that we talk about and wrestle with on this show um, is the question of evil. Because mm -hmm. um, like you said, it, there, there, there do seem to be some, some people that, that are, that appear that way. But for, for the most part, it's like the, the vast majority of us are on the spectrum, but that, that, um, that very, well, one thing about that very tiny group of people, um, I'd consider, pro I'd probably consider most of the people that could be categorized that, like that as psychopaths. But the thing about about clinical psychopaths is that they're not very interesting, aside from their um, their being as psychopaths. Like if you read a, a book about psychopathy, 
Um, and these are people who have zero empathy, um, zero remorse about any acts that they do. They're completely self-serving as, as far as we can tell. And th but they're just not very interesting people. So, so unless you're writing a, a like crime fiction about, about trying to, to catch some, uh, some serial killer, like, well, I, I suppose that they, they, you know, a, a real psychopath could, could fulfill a role in, in certain stories, but, but that's not what you're, that's not what you're doing. Like, uh, you know, and it's not, so I can totally understand that. Yes. I, I, I get so, um, upset too. When I think of those poor people who are mm. like that, why, I, you know, why, what, what's, what, what's the purpose of, of it? I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to get into that, but no, I couldn't, um, mm -hmm. include those in my book. So I apologize for the few silly villains I have written in the course of my career. <laughs> you are <laughs> forgiven. Way, yeah. <laughs> well, to, um, to change directions a bit, um, I was wondering about how you saw the, uh, the attraction between characters where there's an almost instant recognition between it's, it seemingly occurs, you know, throughout the majority of your novels where there's a, there's an instant attraction that is usually upsetting in some way for some reason. Um, but nevertheless, they, they can't help but feel this attraction. Um, and I'm curious to know your thoughts on, um, well, I guess you could say true love in, in one instance and kind of like a soulmate uh, type situation. Um, but also the, the, the dynamic of, of how the characters uh, interact. Is it a purely physical thing that from the bottom up allows you know, uh, higher emotions to come into play? Or is this kind of more a, a top-down thing where it's like the spirit or the essence of these two people recognize each other? and are able to uh, work downward to form a relationship? I don't think it has to be an either or, does it? It, um, it can be either, depending upon the situation and the, and the couple. I don't think I ever do it the same way all the time. Um, I don't think there's always instant attraction between my characters, but if you think about life, uh, and the people you meet, there are some people, whether it's a romantic connection or just an, a, or not, there are some people that you feel an instant connection to, or at least a, a sort of interest in, mm -hmm. and other people are just strangers passing by. Um, it, it's an interesting question because I don't think I've ever actually pondered it before. Um, so what is it? Um, maybe since I've never actually thought of it, it's just something that comes organically from the characters. What is it that that creates this? You could say since I'm writing romances, it's convenient, you know, he's the hero, he's the heroine, so they have to have some connection, otherwise this story isn't going to get written. Um, but what is it in, in life? Why is it that some people, you think, I, I, I could really have her as a friend. I'm talking about myself now. Um, from a very short acquaintance. And other people, maybe I can chat to in a, in a friendly way, but never think there's a connection there. And certainly, you know, in the, with the opposite sex, yes, there is cert certainly uh, people from, from the other sex that you think, oh, you know, He's pretty nice. He's pretty hot, or you know, I I like the look of him, or you know, I like the way he talks, or or no, nah, you know, he's he's good looking and he's nice and he's this and that, but no, nah. I'm, I'm I'm thinking off the top of my head because I've never thought of this before, mm -hmm. but it, it is an interesting question. What is it that connects some people with other people, and? It doesn't have to be hostility with other people, or sometimes there is, but um, why is there no connection at all with, with the vast majority of people who probably could be very good friends or partners or lovers or whatever, but uh, they just, there's no 
whatever it is there i don't call it a spark but that mm-hmm. sounds too much like a romantic relationship there's no or some people call it chemistry there's no chemistry there uh mm-hmm. I, i'll have to be aware of that as i write <laughs> what is it yeah that was uh, one of our one of our listeners submitted a, a version of that question so um ah. yeah but we we've i think we all like Maybe we just all think alike, but I think we we all kind of were thinking the same thing because you said I, I liked what you said about well, it's a romance in a sense it has to be there, you know. Otherwise, how are we going to have this story? And I think I think that's very true. It that it has to be there naturally, but we don't know why it it it's there in the first place because it, it seems that there is something mysterious about about, and it doesn't even. It doesn't even need to be, well, I'll put it this way. You can have an instant attraction to someone and then later find out that that was a big mistake. Mm-hmm. So, so it's not like it, it's, it's always true love, but you, but we, I, I still don't think anyone knows why it happens to a particular person. Is it, yeah. is it something about just the, the shape of their face or, you know, the, 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 the color of their elbows? I mean, it's it could be it could be anything but it, it strikes you in life out of nowhere and seemingly totally randomly but it happens and then i think that in the stories that you write where that does happen it's it's a it's a it's un, seeing that process unfold from that initial initial attraction but then like you said not all the stories are like that because sometimes sometimes there there isn't a that at least not on the surface, there isn't that initial strong attraction and the attraction mm-hmm. develops over time. And then, mm-hmm. then the characters might realize, oh, well, you know, maybe there was more of an attraction that like uh, there was something going on that I just didn't realize back then. And again, it's one of those seamless things, but in this case with the, with the life of the character where it started out one way and then it has, by the end of the, by mid or end of the story, it has the character kind of reinterpreting their earlier self and what their earlier self was thinking and feeling and that's part of their their developmental process too so there are all these there are all these variations but it seems like i guess that's i guess that's just uh i guess that's just love (laughs) there's something very mysterious about it and it it works it, it works in all these in all these strange ways and i think that is the mystery like the that love is the the mystery of life. It's the it's the thing that's hidden and the thing that we're we're all looking for, and and in in this kind of in this maze of life, you know that that is the goal that we're all searching for, whether we realize it or not. And and that's how I see romance um, novels is looking at taking a bunch of those paths in that maze and you know it's it's there it's it's tangible it's a uh, it's the purpose of of uh, of the book and the story and i think that's maybe why um as i've as i've heard i think it was on one of the comments on uh, on your facebook page that romance novels are the top selling novels you know it's the top selling genre out there and i think i think that's why What do you think? I think I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can I can add to that. Yes, I, I do agree. It's um, the, the thing is we all experience it. Mm-hmm. It's part of our lives. We need one another. None of us, or very few of us, can live in isolation. We we need family. We need friends, and we need romantic partners um and and so you know working out how we find them and how we create a community and and happiness for ourselves through these things is important because it's something we all do whether we're conscious of it or not and yes that is something that romance novels do explore and how this happens Mm -hmm. Sometimes characters, sometimes there's no apparent contraction, um, attraction between characters at the beginning of romance. Sometimes it's quite the opposite. Sometimes there's actual hostility. 
and, and real conflict there. And, um, you know, how, how do you make a romantic relationship out of this? You know, what is it about this hostile relationship that can actually bring happiness and fulfillment and contentment to these same two people? It's, um, you know, it's a really interesting and a really important question to explore in the course of a book, because it's something we all do through our lives. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this is pretty much what you were saying. Well, w one of the comments we had gotten to the video we did a few weeks ago uh, was by another author. I, her name escapes me right now, but she put the romance novel genre in the terms of the hero's journey, which I thought was terrific. Uh, the original romances were like the, the grail stories. The, and, yes, mm -hmm. and, and so yeah. th there was this definite kind of um, uh, parallel uh, or, or, or line of uh, storytelling that, that's encoded in, in the best of these stories. And along with them, the, the terror in some cases, uh, the risk taking, um, the adventure of that's that's sometimes acted out with the the villain uh, and the the drama between the protagonists, uh, but sometimes and quite often uh, internally, where the the hero's journey is a journey into one's self, and so I was wondering, Mary, if you had any uh, thoughts about that dimension to uh, your stories and this genre in general? Oh, yes. I think in most of my books, my both my hero and my heroine have to journey into themselves. Because I'm trying to think if there are any exceptions, there probably are. But I would say in most of my books, the hero and the heroine at the beginning of their stories are not whole as individuals. There's something that's not quite um, right. There's something that's stopping them from being who they're meant to be, from being happy. And sometimes it's a big something, sometimes it's not. But yes, part of the, the journey of the book is that they go into themselves and somehow find a way of healing themselves. And very often, because it's because this isn't two parallel stories, it's a love story, they, they sort of help each other in a way mm -hmm. to, uh, if, if not helping each other to heal, help them understand themselves. And, um, you know, through the growing feelings they're having for the other and the growing love, they, they learn to, one of you used the word risk, uh, just now, um, they learn to sort of risk mm -hmm. going into themselves and letting go of whatever it is that's that's holding them back from healing and, and able to love. So yeah, I would say it's a major part of almost all my books is self-healing, going inside. Um, it, it's not just a sort of outer attraction and uh, romance and love story between two people it's there, there are inner works that have to go on as well plus working out whatever it is between them that's holding them back from um, being able to commit to each other for a lifetime of not happily ever after i don't write happily ever after I write happy endings but I, I always try to give the sense they're going to have to work on this for the rest of their lives. It's, you know, it's not a given that they will be blissfully happy for the rest of their lives. But yes, in, an inner journey is, is part of the, the process. And, and I think that in a way, um, because like something that, uh, that came to me when we were doing the last show, Adam had a realization about reading your books and I felt compelled to say Adam it's not only you because th this process of healing of um, integrating oneself is so personal and intimate we we don't 
we don't really know, uh, we don't have that much experience with what it could look like or is, uh, or we might be reluctant to engage in it because it can be so frightening. But I think that we, we get whole kinds of um, presentations of it. Um, this is what it could look like. This is what it could sound like. This is what, uh, at least in this story, was a, a crucial piece for the character that, that helped to make him or her healed and more functional and capable of meeting the future and, and serving their partner. So, you know, aside from going into therapy or reading a self-help book or any of the number of other ways that people are used to um, learning about themselves and, and, and engaging in the processes that would help them to grow, I think that, and I said this last time too, that, you know, these stories and, and the, the work that the characters do are kind of, um, uh, they're, they're stepping stones. They're, um, that's not quite right, but they're, they're kinds of uh, examples of mm. what, what it, you know, what you can do too, what, what it might feel like, what you can think or, the, or, or use as a, you know, gee, my, you're reading a, a part of one of your stories and you, and you think, oh, wow, when that happened in my life, it was kind of analogous. Not exactly, but there were enough features of it that, are, that resemble one to the other that I can look back and, and say, that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of what happened. And, and, but in your book, there, this is how the character is now facing that memory, that pain, that trauma, and mm -hmm. deciding to use uh, whatever resources they have to grow from it and engage in the present. So that's, I think, one of the, even if it's not intended, it's one of the, the wonderful uh, benefits of reading these yes, stories. Yes, that is lovely. A lovely comment, a lovely thing to do. Um, you know, I, it's so much, I think, what most of us do and what most of my characters do. The real problem is a problem of honesty, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, not really facing the truth and acknowledging it and I, not, not just... Uh, in the, in the form of acknowledging it to other people and apologizing for wrongs done. I don't necessarily mean that. But, you know, acknowledging that, yeah, this is something that's wrong with me. I'm, I'm too judgmental. I, I, you know, I'm always right. And to actually realize that, that, that you do this and admit it and decide that, no, I'm not always right. You know, other people think they're always right too and they but they're totally different from me so who is right and uh, to acknowledge this you know that I'm just giving you an example mm -hmm. um to, to to actually learn to tell the truth about yourself I, I said earlier we don't always understand ourselves um and you know understand why we did that why we said that and I think that's part of the reason that we have this image of ourselves we think we are one way because we don't face the truth of the fact that I'm not perfect. And if, you know, if someone says to me, you're so judgmental, it's not, not. Uh, it's, it's natural human nature. I, you know, I, I only do that because I'm always right. Um, but to, to sometimes hear what somebody says to you, which, which makes you think, oh, you know, that's horrible and that's hurt my feelings. But to think, well, is there any truth in what they've said? Are they right? And to actually face it and, you know, learn to tell the truth about yourself or to face the truth about yourself. Um, and, you know, this, if, if you're writing characters and you're following the same process, can help write characters. And perhaps, as you've just said, it can help readers read those characters and think, gosh, that's, that's me. You know, I, I, I'm just like that. And, and this is how she worked it out. She, is, is this what you're talking about? Is this the... Uh, Pretty much. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> along those lines then, uh, has there been any particular characters or particular stories that had a uh, personal impact on you in the, in a similar way that, you know, some reading some of these stories has, has been impactful for us? I'm not sure. I just, I can't think of any specific example. Mm -hmm. I think maybe all of my writing combined has gradually changed me as a person, or at least made me a, a more complete person. Perhaps, you know, delving into characters and working them out is really working out part of me as well, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in writing characters who've had to face the fact, to use the same example, that they are too judgmental, maybe I've learned, well, maybe I am too. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and mm -hmm. then you, you see you're a little more open and loving and all the rest of it. Um, someone recently made a point, I forget where, where it was, of saying how how kind my literature is, that my books show such a lot of kindness. And I thought, oh, do they? And I, was, I really liked that. And I, you know, if, if that's true, that's wonderful because that comes from me. And I can't think of a much nicer thing to be than a kind person. So, um, so rather than me sort of imposing my values on my characters, maybe they're imposing theirs on me. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe I'm working through my own character as I'm creating. Mm. Because, you know, I say my characters are not me, they're other people, but really they are me, aren't they? I mean, they come from me mm -hmm. or through me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, that's very interesting, Mary, because we, we were talking about, um, and there were some people were in touch with who were reading your books and also uh, getting back to this question of, you know, you just said the characters come through you. Uh, do you think that there is a, uh, an element of you tapping into a kind of collective unconscious or go ahead? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> oh, okay. definitely. Yes. I, I think this, um, this is part of the fact that I'm a, Panzer, you know, someone who can't plan a book ahead of time because it's not there. It doesn't come from here. I can sit and think all day and nothing comes, absolutely nothing. As soon as I start writing, out it all comes. Where does it come from? It didn't come from here. There's no other part of me it can come from. <laughs> I still don't think so. Uh, it comes from me. <laughs> No, I, I really, I really believe that. I think the mind, you know, that there's a human mind, but there's another mind, a universal mind. And I think creative people bypass this and go straight into that, but only when they sort of surrender to it. That's it. That sounds a little bit extravagant, but when they trust it mm. and allow it. I have a daughter who's a hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. And she, she wrote a book last year. She wrote it very quickly. And she said she didn't write it. Mm -hmm. She said she just opens herself up and out it comes. Mm -hmm. And as she was describing that to me, I thought, yeah, she's a chip off the old block, all right. <laughs> she's not, write, not writing fiction. She's just writing books about her, her uh, hypnotherapy, but she's got the same gift, the mm -hmm. same gift that I mm -hmm. have. It is a gift. Mm -hmm. I don't claim any credit for it. I claim credit for using it and honing it but i don't claim credit for the gift itself very very thankful i have it and, and so many other people are too thankful that you have it <laughs> I well, mean, thank you <laughs> but you said something that uh, said something i wanted to get back to when you were you were mentioning well maybe there's a there one of the important things how to phrase this well truth is important and in these stories a lot of a lot of what happens and a lot of the a lot of what drives the the characters decisions and mistakes and interactions with others they are in varying degrees and in different ways 
blocking off the truth from themselves and others. It's obvious when it's to someone else, and sometimes the characters themselves are are even, well, they're often aware that they are lying to others, and oftentimes that is a another source of conflict for themselves, of inner conflict, but then there are the lies that they tell themselves about themselves. They have an image of who they are or who they should be, and it's it's apparent uh it's apparent while reading it just because it's because it's true to life that that is to a certain extent skin deep like you can see these characters and you can see them pretending essentially you can see them pretending to themselves and if you i guess if if you have an experience of that in yourself you can see you can see it it's like oh well you know i i i've done that before i can see this character doing it i can see that their that their image of themselves their persona is is only skin deep it's like just just be authentic you know just tell the truth tell yourself the truth and just um like you know that one thing that you've been holding off telling your your significant other and for all of these and you're you're scared of it for all these reasons and you you don't do it for all these reasons well just try saying it just just spit it out just just tell that one little piece of truth and i think that when you when you described your your you, you described romance as about love, but I think that that truth is 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 almost another word for love. It's they're they're so so intertwined with each other that you can't you can't have one without the other. And I, well, the way I, just what popped into mind when I was thinking about it when you were speaking of it was that in a sense you could almost think of truth as the the or or love as the feeling of truth and and vice versa. It's like there's there's some strange coin you know with love and truth on on either side of each other and part of the the unfolding of this love in in a romance is is the unveiling of truth as it comes um what do you think about that (laughs) yeah yes you're right again it's something i hadn't really thought about the truth and love are two sides of the same coin that they're sort of the same thing you can't have well, maybe you can have truth without love, can you? But you you can't have love without truth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You, you know, if you're in a love relationship with someone and you're holding something back, even if it's nothing to do with the relationship itself, it's still it, it it's not a complete relationship. Mm-hmm. And if there's something you're holding back from yourself, then you can't be a whole enough person to. To give love so yeah i think truth and love are all twined up with each other even if they're not the identical thing mm-hmm. yeah hmm. well something to think about point. <laughs> yes, yeah. did you have something to say about that adam uh, otherwise i well I just change to topic. um just to say with the uh what you were saying about how you know there's there's you know how could you have or maybe it's possible to have um, or to not have uh, truth without love, I think was yeah. was the one. Yes. Um, yeah. Is it? I don't. I don't necessarily know that that you can, because in in order to value the truth of something it, is to to want to love it in in some way, shape, or form, and that doesn't necessarily mean I think a romantic love, mm. um, because I see. It's like you say in your books, you know, love is not merely a, a feeling. It's it's more than that. It's it's a verb. It's um, it's a it's a bunch, it's actions. Um, yes. And you can love people in different ways. So, say as an example, somebody is uh, severely addicted to, you know, something that is detrimental to them. To continue to support them financially or by other means would be to not love them because you don't value them enough to cut them off from, mm-hmm. you know, what's um, allowing them to continue on that, that dark path. Oh, and yes. to acknowledge the, the truth of that situation, as painful as it may be, mm-hmm. is to love them, I think. Even if it leads to their death. And, and the feeling that they've been neglected and rejected 
No, I, I'm just playing devil's advocate here. I'm thinking this through with you because mm -hmm. I'm not sure of the answer, mm -hmm. uh, whether you can have truth. I, I think maybe there's such a thing as truth without love. I don't know. I don't know. Well, but I think maybe th I, I think about it this way. There, if you think about uncomfortable truths, let's use that as an example, maybe to approach the, the wider, the wider truth. What is truth? <laughs> the wider truth. Um, <laughs> If you have an uncomfortable truth, you really have to love truth in order to get it and in order to, to find it and to accept it as truth. I think that because true, basically you have to have a value system, a value for truth in order to value truth. So I think that right in the, in the very act of, of having a, just in the word itself, truth, truth, it implies that truth is more valuable. The truth is valuable in some way. And I think that in, in the intellectual senses that we might think about truth, I think that might just be an intellectual version of love, that love is actually what, what is the, um, the, the force that's pulling us towards knowledge or towards um, facts or, you know, all the kind of maybe analytical, like, uh, you know, male brain truths that we might think about. Because, because I, I, I mean, and you can even see people that seemingly um, engage in activities directed towards the truth that maybe don't seem to involve love of some sort. But maybe it's kind of like that. Even it might be a, it might be a low level version of love. But I think that if love is everything, that then it it is at the root of of all of those of all of those truths that um, um, even if they're uncomfortable because. Because that is, to, to find the truth and to find an uncomfortable truth, there has to be a, a love underlying that, I think, um, in order to accept it. And a lot of the truths that people find for themselves, like, like the characters in these stories, are uncomfortable truths. And they, ha they have to take that risk, you know, to come back to something we were talking about before, they have to take that risk and there has to there has to be that underlying value for for the truth for them to to take that plunge to you know to go into the dragon's lair and to to find that truth to accept it and that's that's kind of part of why I was why I was seeing this this uh, intertwining between between truth and love because it seems like well there are, well do you have any do you have any counter examples can you can you <laughs> You're just making me think of the book I'm writing right now. Oh. I'm Ooh. The, the way through it, but it, it really is dealing head on, deep down with this question. Okay. Um, about forty percent into the book, uh, the the male protagonist um, discovers a truth and insists on telling it, mm. even though he's advised not to and in the process he destroys the whole happy illusion that his family and his whole neighborhood have lived through for years and years and years ago total destruction of everything and he has he goes away and he joins the military and goes off to fight in the Napoleonic Wars. And then six years later, the rest of the book, he comes back and has to deal with the, the destruction he has wrought. And the whole question of the book is, did he do the right thing? Mm -hmm. You know, the, everyone lived with this illusion and most of them knew it was an illusion. They knew it was a lie. They were all happy. Mm -hmm. Now they're not. Hmm. You know, it's all destroyed. This is, you know, it's the focus of the book. And, and the, the more you were talking, the more I was thinking of that book and thinking, mm. and, you know, <laughs> I'm still, I'm sort of part on the fence. I don't know quite how this is mm -hmm. going to be. Did he do entirely the right thing? Or did he do entirely the wrong thing? Or somewhere between the two? And how is it going yeah. to be worked out? Yeah, and it, well, and it could be just could, to just to jump yeah. in. Um, I'm reading the Westcott series right now, and mm -hmm. 
I think you could make a, a similar uh, statement about the the series in general because of how it all started with the revealing of this very uncomfortable truth where they had been living for the past 20 years under this this one illusion and then all of a sudden they find out well it's not actually that way at all and so the whole series is them just coming to terms with that yeah the difference is that they didn't know it was an illusion in yeah the West Coast. yeah they, they, they do in this book mm -hmm. the, the hero doesn't realize that he's thinking he's telling mm -hmm. them the, tr the truth that nobody knows but mm -hmm. they do and so he's destroyed the whole house of cards that they've built. Well, maybe, maybe it's possible to to err in your delivery of the truth, <laughs> because yes, yeah. yeah, because the the truth can be used as a weapon, and yes. and maliciously. Yeah. So, um, so there is that, but. Uh, but then again, um, like uh, I think that there are caricatures of love that can be used maliciously and to be used as weapons, right? So, so is yeah. it? So th those are the questions: is what is what is the what is the actual truth in this situation, and what is the what is the what is the love in this situation? So, um, yeah, well, it's an interesting question. Is that may, may I ask? Um, is that can you tell us a bit about your new book um, or the the book that you're working on? Like, is it it's, is it part of your current series or is it a new thing? It's the start of a new series, okay. a family series, yes. And and this is the first book. So the whole of the series will be built on this, you know, telling of truth that happens. Mm -hmm. And it has to resolve itself in this book for the hero and heroine. But the future books will deal with the other characters and mm -hmm. what effect it's had on them and how how they deal with it and adjust their lives mm -hmm. accordingly. And of course, they'll have love partners who will have their own issues as well. But mm -hmm. it's it's the basis, the basic um, crisis of the mm -hmm. whole series. Great. Yeah. Similar to the Westcott series in that way mm -hmm. that you get the basic catastrophic situation for the whole family. It starts with a bang. <laughs> Yes, the rest of the series has to resolve it for everybody concerned, not just the mm -hmm. main characters of that book. Just a comment on a feature of the, the different series that surprised me a little bit, and that is that even if there are um, two central characters that are being focused on in a particular story, you have a whole set of other characters who are in their lives have these significant parts to play in the protagonist's story and then go on to have significant stories of their own. And it, it's as though what seems to be said is uh, we each have a, a greater effect on other people and their lives than we realize. We're, we're all part of each other's lives. Yeah. Um, when we've grown uh, in some way, we actually have a, uh, or can have a positive knock-on effect with those people in our lives. Um, sometimes there's even an impetus on the part of people who have found happiness to help those who are struggling to work out their own issues. And it's as though there is a kind of network of um, positive life-affirming uh, work being done um, that, that kind of spans multiple books so that, you know, you're not just reading this one-off, you know, two people have a struggle, uh, learn about themselves, come together, and that's it. There is this kind of uh, web yes. of relationships. And... Yes. Uh, which is it's just a lovely feature of these books i think again it's like real life isn't it you know we're all heroes and heroines of our own stories but then everyone we come into contact with is a hero or heroine of their own story um 
so I, I, li I love writing series for that reason, you know, everybody, the hero and heroine are all in all in this book, everyone else is sort of peripheral. But if they're real people, they also, you know, are heroes and heroines of their own stories. So I like to go on to tell those stories. It, it makes it more like, like real life. You know, it's not just two people are the important ones in this life and they, 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 you know, they fall in love and they marry and they live happily ever after. Nobody else matters, mm -hmm. or at least they're just there as, you know, mm -hmm. as a cast of, you know, people, people in the stands. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like to think of, of us as all, you know, at different times, heroes and heroines of our own lives, but, you know, we have to realize that the same is true for everyone else. I I have two more questions, at least two more planned questions. Um, first, this one also is kind of inspired by some of the some of the things that our readers have sent in, uh, like suggested questions, and it's again one that that I shared with them a, a, curi a curiosity because you, as a historical romance writer, you focus on a particular time period. Um, a lot, not not all of them, but a lot in the the Regency. So the, it's a like a, a Regency romance set in the the Regency period, early eighteen hundreds, like you said, Napoleonic War, that kind of time period. I want to know what you think the advantages to you um, are for that period of time, particular. Like, do you think that you could you could do what you do in any period, or is there something? Is there something about that period, and and what is it? Um, it it's a very unique. Something can be very unique. It's either unique or it isn't. It was a unique period in uh, in British history. Uh, you know, coming between the eighteenth century, the Georgian era, and the Victorian era that followed it. It was just a short period, but it was um it was a time when things were changing, um, you know, industry was coming on strong, um, social conscience was, was growing, um, women were beginning very, very gradually, maybe hardly beginning, they had a toe in the door of becoming more assertive and more their own people. Um, Visually, it, it's a it's a glorious age. You know, if ever you see any movies set in the Regency era, you know the the, the um, fashions were just gorgeous for both men and women, and very different from the eras before and after them. Um, I think when you when you want to write love stories that have a sort of societal structure and um, a sort of set value system, which was not by any means perfect, uh, and that's explored in in many of my books. But still, it makes it gives you a sort or gives me a sort of base mm -hmm. on which to write my books, and and it just suits what I try to do. I I always tell people I couldn't possibly write a contemporary romance because I don't know enough about my own my own era. <laughs> Um, you know, it's so it it's so changeable that anything I wrote would be um, out of date or would be ridiculous to so many readers. It's much easier to take um, an era that's finished and done with, and it's sort of set in stone, and you can get in there and write about it. Uh, also, I have this sort of voice. Um, you know, every writer has a voice, which I always say is, is one of their most important assets, if not the most important. I have a voice that's suitable for historicals. I don't speak like as the way contemporary people speak. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, it, it suits me. I can write in the sort of English that would, would have been used more or less, in the Regency era. Um, but mainly, I think it's it's to have this sort of set society. It's it's not entirely authentic because my my stories 
concentrate on the upper classes. I mean, there was, there was a, a huge and horrible underbelly to the whole of the Regency era. And I do, I, although I occasionally touch on it, it I don't um, No, it's the promise of spring, one of you is reading. Have any yep. of you read um, um, A Precious Jewel? The, the man who married a, a, a prostitute that he took out of a brothel, she was his client in the brothel. Anyway, that sort of gets into the underbelly a bit, that book. But normally I don't, so it's just upper class. But taken that fact, um, it, it's sort of perfect for the message I have. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, one of uh, that's one of the things that... that um that our, our listeners and viewers had said is, uh, is that it's such a unique period um, why, for the reason of that structure, even that, that it does have, does have a very, uh, very strict and set um, moral or like just societal framework. There are rules. There are very, very specific rules for al almost all of these different types of interactions but at the same time, um, for all its flaws, that system actually allows for the the little the like exceptions to those rules, right? For you can you can have these characters who who can break the rules or bend the rules a little bit in order to to have it has this. To be authentic. Yes. yes. Yeah. Be authentic. Um, it was the age in which Jane Austen was writing, and mm -hmm. she was writing contemporary literature you know that was her own age she was a contemporary but, romance but, writer yes but if you consider uh, elizabeth bennett for example in pride and prejudice mm -hmm. you know she she is a woman of of the age mm -hmm. and yet she manages to come across as a very strong woman mm -hmm. who refused well, she refused one marriage offer when when she might have been thought to be desperate because he was a horrible you know, Mr. Collins, a horrible man. Mm -hmm. Her friends came along and married him because he offered the respectability of marriage. But she also refused this hugely advantageous marriage offer from Mr. Darcy because he was so arrogant. And, you know, she... And really, that is so admirable for a real Regency person that she would do that because marriage was everything to women in those days. They had no life, no real respectability without marriage. Mm -hmm. Being a spinster was a horrible fate for a woman in those days. So, uh, you know, you, you can go to contemporary literature and realize that people could not exactly break the rules, but break expectations. And come out on top, you know. She she ends up with Mr. Darcy, obviously, mm -hmm. and very happy. But he had a lot of adjusting to do and growing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So so yes, you, characters can break the rules. People can break the rules. But it has to be authentic. There has yeah. to be good reason for it, and you have to be able to persuade the the reader that, you know, yeah, they they were they were real Regency characters, but they still did this and. You know, somehow it was all right. It worked for them. Well, it's almost like you're you're having to convince the reader that it works in the same way that the characters are having to convince the dragons, yeah. uh, exactly. as you would call them, uh, yeah. that it's okay for them to break the rules as well. And so that's it's this great balance of uh, of it being authentic at the time and for the times reasons, and also you know for us as readers to experience it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we we got into uh, um, some semi heated discussions about our our previous discussion, and one of them was because when in the show we were discussing, we were talking about um, well, maybe it was a poor choice of words, but we talked about your books and and having traditional values, and of course, traditional values, um, depending on how you define them, can be. <laughs> can be variously interpreted let's say that way put it that way but um but so i want to ask you something but i, I want to preface it by saying that given that what the discussion we just had about that last question if you look at the period of time and and the stories you're writing you have all of these characters who are 
going against their traditional values, or at least finding a way to operate within them. They're very, you could call them like progressive for their times, that um, there are all kinds of expectations and um, and rules that, that might strike the main characters as silly or outdated or even wrong. And so they find a way to... Um, to, to get around that or to, to work within it. And, but then, but the, and so you've got, so they are the ones injecting this newness into this, into this stale uh, societal framework. Now, I wanted to know if you have any thoughts, because I know, I know you just said that uh, you, you don't know enough about you, about the present time to write a, a contemporary romance, right? Uh, for, uh, among other reasons. But um, it, seems to, it seems to me that in the present time, there's almost, there, there, is no, there is no social, well, maybe not no, but very little social framework, like, like uh, that social structure that keeps everyone in line. It's almost like anything goes. So sex in um in a regency story is very different than than i think sex in a contemporary framework and from the contemporary framework the the transgressive progressive characters in your novels are are to me very traditional yes yes so do you have any do you have any thoughts on that um maybe do you have any any thoughts on um, like sexuality in modern times, in, in our in our time, and um, it, part of it, is, well, I'll just leave it like that. Do, do you have any thoughts about about yeah, sex today? Difficult to to answer. I don't like to impose any ideas of my own, any values, any beliefs, any sort of norms, expectations on other people. Um, maybe that makes me a, a, a modern woman. Maybe that's the way many people are today. I have my own way of living. Um, I have my own beliefs and values, I suppose. But um, I, <laughs> I was using an example earlier of me being judgmental. I'm always right. I don't think that really is me at all. That was just a, you know a hypothetical example. I, I I'm not judgmental. I, um, I I try to see where everyone is coming from when they you know when they when they believe something. I, I have my own beliefs and sometimes it get terribly heated when I read or hear other people who are spouting totally different mm -hmm. uh, you know particularly when you get into the area of politics or religion for example I can get terribly annoyed <laughs> when when I read other opinions but I, I try always to think in most cases these people genuinely believe this genuinely feel this it's diametrically opposed to what I feel and believe, but you know, does one of us have to be wrong and the other one right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, the, the only thing that infuriates me most, I suppose, is that so few people can try to get to a middle, mm -hmm. to understanding one another and and accepting. I mean, there's some things, some things that a person feels so strongly about you cannot accept a diametrically opposed view but in most issues even if you can't accept it you, you know you can say well yeah it's that that person genuinely believes that and that person is not a monster mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so I'm not sure where we started with this. I'm, I'm into well, this now. I'm not sure if I'm heading off on on a tangent or if this was the original issue. But uh, well, it works. No, I, yeah. no. Sorry, it, go ahead. It works because um, because I think that given that uh, given the world as it is and people as they are and all all of the conflicts in the world today, I think that also that also. Uh, brings to light the another advantage of 
of writing in a, a time and place else uh mm -hmm. otherwise you know a, yeah. a different yeah. time and place yeah. because yeah. because the things that uh because the things that make those books your books or or books written about a different time and place relevant are the things that are universal mm -hmm. so it's almost like a way of of getting around all of the all of the hot button issues you know all of the controversies and you can say here is here is a, a humanity you know here are individuals here are real people and you don't have to think about politics you don't have to think about like all the things going on but you can find something true in them you know you can find something that's universal and that that can be applied to your life even if you're not uh, an upper class regency duke you know and <laughs> etc yes yeah yeah it, yeah it's a good point e even when you said you were a little bit hesitant about using the phrase traditional values mm -hmm. because that's a bit of a hot button issue yeah, yeah. Um, so yes i can write in the values of regency england but i can make them my character's own and hope that they they don't come across as preachy i i don't even particularly know what traditional values are but yeah. um mm -hmm. I, I know what some people think they are or should be and then you get into all the conflict again mm -hmm. so yes you're right I, I hadn't really thought of that maybe it's why i'm so comfortable in in writing what I write, I can just escape into that world, mm -hmm. make it my own, and I don't have to deal with, you know, it, well, sometimes it crops up, you know, people will uh, object to something in my books, and I have to defend it, or, you know, at least listen to their criticisms. But I think it might happen a lot more if I were writing contemporary romance, surely it would, because you'd run against people with mm -hmm. totally opposite views mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well did you guys i had one question did you guys have any questions before before i get to it I just wanted to affirm your point harrison because the, the the phrase that kept coming up uh for me was there there is a certain amount of freedom within limitation or within the parameters mm -hmm. of this uh, world yeah. that you've entered in that you know counterintuitively works to ho really hone in on the timelessness and the um there was another word you used uh j just the universality of mm. of some of these key core um issues uh yes. so th th that was like one of the final things i wanted to affirm about y your choice to use this particular genre to Nice. Uh, That's nice to tell your stories yeah it, it, again it wasn't a conscious choice on my part but when you put it into words i think yeah that's exactly why i'm doing what i'm doing so yeah <laughs> you've done quite a bit of this this afternoon you've sort of put into words <laughs> things i hadn't really thought about adam um no i didn't really have anything okay. other than to to just um say how much i appreciate your work and and what you've written and how you've done it and um would like to offer my heartfelt gratitude for having spent so much time and effort and energy into honing your craft because you can oh. you've you've been able to create some wonderful pieces of literature that are uh enjoyable at the very bare minimum and uh, quite revealing and revelatory at, at the peak of it. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. <laughs> well, ditto for all of that. But I want to. I want to have a fun question at the end here. Um, I've read. I think I read on your website that um, you said that you you like reading, of course, and you'll that you read a, uh, a lot of, of, of a variety of things, but it has to kind of grab you and it, you have to kind of stick with it because after reading Moby Dick, you thought, okay, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to waste my time on something that isn't entertaining, right? <laughs> so I want to, uh, maybe you can give two two answers. I want, uh, I want to know what some of your favorite, maybe recent books have been that you've read, but I want to know if there's anything that you really enjoy that would be very surprising for uh, for your readers to 
or, or for, for readers or viewers here to to find out like do you have a, a like a guilty pleasure when it comes to reading or something that's just kind of way out there like like um some strange science fiction or you know anything weird no not really i read a lot of uh, mystery okay um which isn't really you know wild and uh, unexpected um in in non-fiction i read a lot of um, spirituality particularly um centering around buddhism and uh, okay. not not mm -hmm. I, I don't even like to put a label but probably closer to buddhism but of course i you know i come from a judeo christian background i was brought up as a baptist mm -hmm. in wales um became a catholic in Canada for many years so and you know you can't just some people can I can't, can't just abandon that it's mm -hmm. that, that heritage is very very precious to me and, and it will always be sort of at the base of who I am but <clears throat> it's no longer where my spiritual journey has taken me so I do a lot of reading I don't know if that would be surprising to uh, to readers or not, it's certainly not wild and um, spooky. At least I don't think it is. Maybe <laughs> it is to some. <laughs> but apart from that, in fiction, I, I I do read a lot of different types of fiction. Um, you asked me to name certain books. Yeah. Well, is there have... is there a book that that you've read recently that kind of stands out? It really grabbed me. I I'm not even sure. I I tend to be to read sort of by by author rather than mm. individual book and i can't think not recently anyway i can't think of any book that's really sort of reached out and grabbed me by the the throat and wouldn't let me go uh, more than any other mm -hmm. um i i like reading older um mystery fiction like uh, patricia wentworth i don't know if you've heard of her and uh oh i shouldn't have started that unless I had a little list. <laughs> I think of all sorts of uh, people. Agatha Christie to a certain extent, but mm -hmm. I prefer Patricia Wentworth. Mm. Um, I like Kerry Greenwood, who's uh, an Australian um, mystery author. She's a real hoot. I, I love her books. Um, Michael Connolly. Uh, who am I going to think of? Oh, Louise Penny who's Canadian, love her books. Um, Donna Leon, who writes books, her sleuth, her um, police officer is in Venice in Italy. There are about 20 some books in that series, very, very well written. And I think there's a common element in many of them, not all of them, but certainly in Louise Penny and um, Donna Leon, the real sort of depth of character she develops it isn't just a sleuth solving mm -hmm. problems the sleuth is a a real developing character uh, and i like that well i haven't read i haven't read enough of your books yet but have you ever thought of or or may, have you included elements of like mystery and and crime and it, it, solving crimes in your books because i know some some historical romance authors do that Yes. No, I, I, well, sometimes my books have a historical element and I, I always have a little chuckle if readers said, well, I solved the mystery halfway through. <laughs> well, wasn't the point of the book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I thought of it uh, many years ago when I thought maybe I should be branching out a bit. And I did think of, of getting a Regency sleuth and, um, you know, writing a series of Regency mysteries. But that's not where my heart is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for over 30 years, I've written books that are all different from one another and all very precious and all of them excite me as I write them. I love writing them. So why, why stop doing it? Mm -hmm. I know that as a reader, I don't always like it when favorite authors of mine suddenly start writing a different type of book. Mm. I feel cheated, especially if they use the same name and I get this book and I start reading it and I think, well, this isn't so-and-so, you know, I feel cheated. <laughs> so, uh, 
I, I'm happy with what I write and I don't think I'll change now. Great. Well, that's a, that's a good note to, to end on. Not that, well, how many, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little business at the end. You, you, you mentioned that you, you're starting a new series, you know, you're, you're currently writing that one. Um, you do have a book coming out in June. I believe it's another in the Westcott series. And then is there one more in the Westcott series coming out? It's, as well? Yes, it's going to be labeled as a Westcott book now okay. because there, there aren't any more coming. I was going to write a whole lot of books about leftover characters from the Westcott series. And, and this one in November is one of a set of twins, a, a man and a woman. Um, I wrote a book for the woman and obviously the man was going to come next. But, um, you know, I was asked to start a new series, which I did. But okay. I'm being crafty about it. This man is going to link up with one of the characters in this book. She's only nine years old at the beginning of this book. But the, the, the other twin is in his mid-20s in 1825, and this starts in 1808. So she'll be a good age for him by the time I get to her book. So I'll bring the two series mm -hmm. together. If I should live so long. <laughs> Great. Great. That's, That's good because I was actually thinking about it uh, when I was, because I'm, what, like five books into the Westcott series. And I'm like, I don't think she's got enough books for all the rest of these characters. <laughs> so it's, it, I'm glad to hear that uh, you're, you're working on it. Yeah, well, there are nine in the actual series. It was supposed to be eight. And then I wrote a little novella as part of the series. So it's yeah. actually nine. Okay. And then this one will be an add-on, so it'll be 10. She's not a Westcott, but she's very strongly connected to them through marriage. Not her own marriage, but through her father's marriage. So okay. her twin will, if I live long enough, have his book too at the end of this series. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. Well, that has been a, it's been a, a long and interesting and enjoyable and fun conversations so we had a great time having you on mary yes well, thank you very much for yes. having me it's been lovely it's very different from the uh, usual sort of interview i do mm -hmm. i always love interviews but this is very different great well we're, we're glad that you. You, glad that you had a, a good time and uh wish you all the best in your future writing and uh, just thank you again and we will we will link to your website in our show description. Yes. Is there anything else you want to us to link to or to announce? Um, is that pretty much it? That's pretty much it. Okay. Oh, you, oh, you, you can also find Mary on Facebook. Maybe we'll include a, a link to her Facebook page because she, she, po Facebook, she posts great uh, puns. Oh, <laughs> that happened quite accidentally. I started throwing in a few puns and then everybody started sending them to me. <laughs> so I started a folder and everybody loves them. So I post one mostly one a day well, they're very enjoyable okay well, <laughs> take care mary you too thank you for having me i've enjoyed it it was a pleasure thank you thanks thank you elon and adam who's off camera at the moment and harrison thank i'm you. terrible thank on you. things i've got them written down <laughs> you got them correct thank you <laughs> <laughs> right. okay bye then bye-bye